welcome to the PewterCast. I'm Brent Allen, your host. Today is October the 12th, 2016, and this is episode 15, Panthers Declawed. If you're listening to this podcast, unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last couple days, then you are aware that our beloved Buccaneers played on Monday Night Football this past week, where we beat our division rivals, the Carolina Panthers, 17 to 14 in what was a little bit of a heart attack of a game. Now listen, this was significant, Bucks fans. This was really significant, significant because I don't know if you realize this or not, but it has been three years since we were last on a Monday night game. It also happens to have been three years since the last time we've beaten the Panthers, which happens to be on November 18th, 2012. And that one was an overtime win, and I know because I went back and had to look it up just to make sure. So three years, Bucks fans, three years. Now, that last time we beat the Panthers was not on a Monday night. But both of them, Monday night games and beating the Panthers, three years. It's been a long time coming. And we've also lost three games in a row, so it was really great to get this one as a win. And, uh, you know, it was a big game for the Bucks, And it was a big game for us fans. Man, it was a, it was a late game. Uh, you might have seen the tweet that I sent out. I got in a little bit of trouble on Monday night for uh, waking up the kids. Uh, that You know, when Aguayo finally hit that last kick. Man, I screamed, hooted, and hollered, and both of them just started screaming. And my wife looked at me and she said, "You woke them up. You got to go put them back down." So I'm I'm up there about midnight, you know, trying to rock the kids to sleep, getting them back. But you know what? Hashtag it was worth it. Absolutely worth it. And you know, fans have hope again. You know, there are some fans that are that are jaded and are now at least cautiously optimistic. Others are waiting for the Bucks to just kind of implode again and. You know, I don't know. Hopefully this podcast will help change your mind. And uh, then there are some who are just like me who just the uh, hope has been fanned into flame for what this season could potentially be. Now, we're still real early in the season. We don't want to, you know, we don't want to call the end of the season now here just in week five, uh, which is where we're heading into or where we are now. But uh, yeah, guys, hope is here. Now, listen, before we go any further, I've got just one more piece of business I have to take care of which is an iTunes review to read. Now, back before the season started, I put out a challenge to you guys, the listeners, that we would get 25 iTunes reviews before the season started. And you know what? You guys came up with 28 before the season started. And tonight, I'm going to read the last one of that 28. And that's from Papa Noel 33 who says, Great job. Awesome podcast. Stays up to date and puts maximum effort into making sure that fans always have something to listen to. To me, those are two things that set this podcast apart from the rest. Thank you, PewterCast. Well, not a problem, Papa Noel. Thank you so much. And, you know, we really do try to try to make sure that you guys always have something to listen to, something Bucks related And certainly I know, you know, this last week they came out where there's there's no more local morning coverage of sports in Tampa. So, hey, I'm glad to I'm glad to get to be a part of the family that still continues to bring you guys great content about some of our most favorite teams there in Tampa, particularly the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Now, uh, listen, Bucks fans, like I said, that is the last iTunes review that I have to read. So if you'd like to send in a review, I definitely will read it here on the show. Uh, You can do that to iTunes. That's where we're collecting all the reviews. So send that in to iTunes. And even if you don't listen to the show on iTunes, just go over there, create your little account, leave a review, and then go back to listening to the show however you want to do. Uh, and one more quick thank you just before I get out of here uh, to my f- new friend, Naftali Jeptit. And I hope that I pronounced that right because Naftali is from Uganda. And Naftali sent in some cash to help keep the show going. Naftali, thank you so, so much. And hey, Bucks fans, you know what that means? That means we are international to a brand new continent. I didn't even know that we had fellow Bucks fans in Africa, much less in Uganda which is pretty cool. So, uh, Neftali, I am super, super appreciative. And fans, if you would like to join Neftali in sending in a little bit of additional support to the show, you can do that real super easy through a one-time donation to paypal.me forward slash the pewtercast, and that'll get you all taken care of in whatever currency you want to send it in. PayPal will, will do the exchange for you. It's not a problem. Well, guys, I'd like to go ahead and bring on our guest. Uh, I am super excited to get this guest in on a main show here in the regular season. You should probably be very well familiar with his voice. He is what I call the godfather of Buccaneers podcasting. Derek Fournier from What the Buck is here with us for the show. Derek, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you so much, Brent. It's great to be here, man. I appreciate the invite and for the uh, hefty title. <laughs> the godfather of Bucks podcasting. As long as I don't wind up six feet under with cement shoes or something, 
Uh, you're, 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 I'm not even Italian. I married an Italian, but I'm not Italian. You're not Italian. Well, there we go. Well, watch out for uh, for your wife's family, Uncle Vinny or, or someone. Oh, yeah. I, I watch out for sure. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what, <laughs> well, there you go. Derek, how are things going over at uh, What the Buck? You've had uh, Mark Cook as your, as your longtime guest. Is it, a, is it safe to call him your official co-host for this year, or what's going on with all that? Well, Mark's not big on commitment when it comes to these sorts of things, and he, he's a little bit easy when it comes to uh, media, as you as you can tell. And, and I love that about him, to be honest, because mm-hmm. uh, it's good to hear his voice. I think he does a great job for PeterReport.com, and when he gets on the air, whether it be podcast or terrestrial airwaves. So we've been friends for a long time. We come from a similar group of people, uh, though I call him a Polk Countyite. He's actually a Plant Cityan, <laughs> which is Hillsboroughish. Right. Uh, but uh, but I consider him my co-host. I love having him here. It's always great when you have another guy in the studio. It's it's easier to do this thing that we're doing now, face to face. There's there's body language and all that sort of stuff. And for me, I think it, it ends up with me uh, doing a little bit better show. I, I've done this now for this is my eleventh year at What the Buck, and many of them were myself prattling on twice a week for you know two and a half hours, mm-hmm. and even I got sick of my own voice. So mm-hmm. I figured that by adding a a varied voice, and it's funny, we joke around with uh, Chris from uh, formerly a Bucks Brief podcast, and he mm-hmm. comes in, you know, Mark's favorite sport is to interrupt Chris. Right. So even when he's not on the show, he manages to interrupt him. So no, it's good to have him on here, and, and is, of course he's welcome anytime he wants to come. And we're open to other guests as well, I gotta admit, and I'm not sure how appropriate this is, so you can feel free to cut this in post if you want, but if you follow us on Twitter, there was an interesting exchange with a, a former porn star who also does uh, football analysis for Tony Kornheiser's show, who happens mm-hmm. to be a Tampa local. And I just didn't know such a thing existed. And, and her her friend or whatever was saying, well, you know, would you be interested in, in her coming on the show? Listen, if you've got an interesting perspective and, and you're not going to be a belligerent jerk uh, and you're going to back up your position with some form of data, then, yeah, we're always interested in it. That's fun. That's I had no clue that that existed either. That's uh... yeah, check, check the timeline. It's an interesting exchange. I got I got to tell you, and if we have time in the show later, maybe in the fan to fan segment, I can go through it because it was a very odd uh, escalation, as it were. That's what, well, yeah, certainly we'll get there. And speaking of fan to fan, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the show. Uh, right here in our main segment, we are going to be reviewing the game that the Buccaneers just played against the Carolina Panthers. And then we're going to be heading into our top three, where Derek and I are going to be taking a look at our top three impact players or clutch players for the Bucks. And as Derek just referenced, we are going to be finishing up the show with a, a favorite segment of mine, especially when we have a guest on called Fan to Fan Live. So, Derek, what do you say, man? Let's get into it. Welcome back to the Pewter Cast. It is time for our main segment of the day where we're going to be talking about the latest game that the Buccaneers just played at Carolina against the the little kitty Panthers, where we just won 17 to 14, just barely. <laughs> you know, Derek, that was that was a close game right up until the last three seconds, which I don't know that you can take it much closer to the end than, than three seconds. So Derek, I'm going to toss it to you first, man. What were your thoughts on uh, Monday night football coming out against the Panthers? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think the game was, uh, I would say it's pre- it was predictably ugly, but, but I don't know that we predicted that. I think that <laughs> many of us continue to believe that the offense is going to be able to produce fireworks because it has done it. The capability is there now, you know, the injury bug has hit us, which has impacted the running game significantly, but Jaquiz Rogers showed up in a big way, which a number of us were calling for before. And that's not to be a, to slight Charles Sims, uh, who moved over to IR, but he's just not the kind of back that typically is going to be your every down back. We thought right. Rogers might make a difference, and it turned out he did. Now, that doesn't make us sayers of sooth, and no one should break their arms patting themselves on the back, which sometimes people do. <laughs> but the reality is Dirk Cutter knew that with the injuries to the defense, I mean, we were playing with guys whose names were written in Sharpie. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> right. I, I I would challenge any great Bucks fan to name the bottom three on that defensive line rotation. They just couldn't. All right? Everyone knows Lambert at this point, but no one knows those other guys with 70 numbers. They, they could have picked him from the crowd. Right. So he knew he could not leave the defense on the field. What I don't think he could have possibly known 
is that he would be able to control the ball for 13 minutes of the first quarter. Right. I mean, as a Bucs fan, you want the win, and the win allows you to take other victories. Mm-hmm. But the biggest victory in that game, in my opinion, was to come out and dictate the clock in the first quarter because mm-hmm. that allowed the defense to be able to play. Right. Uh, and so, so that was exciting. I hate the whole cardiac kids thing. I mean, I've been a Bucks fan my whole life, so I'm kind of used to it. We're sort of, uh, even when we're up by a large number, we always are waiting for the other foot to fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was at the Hard Rock with the Pewter Report guys at their watch party with a bunch of other Bucks fans, and it was, it was mayhem in there, right? I mean, right. there was joy and sadness and excitement and, and finally, you know, more jubilation at the end when Aguayo comes back. And everyone saw the poetic justice on the wall when they're moving down the field, and you know he's going to get a chance to redeem himself from, from his self being Aguayo and missing all the time right. uh, by getting the game winner. And you just, I, I couldn't even watch it. And Skip Brown was clowning me. If you guys know Skip Brown, he's a very common, you know, he's, he's in the Bucks fan circles. He's always on Pewter Report. He comes to our tailgates. He was sitting right next to me, and, and I was just telling him, tell me if I made it. I can't watch it. Right. So. Yeah, that certainly was a, uh, the moment you saw Jameis uh, take the snap and then just run over to the next hashtag and drop. You know, he wasn't even trying to go, wasn't even trying to go towards the end zone, wasn't trying to gain any yardage. He was just moving over to that, to that hashtag that, that Aguayo wanted and, and he dropped and, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I, I was, I was probably three inches away from my TV during that kick. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's probably a good thing that Aguayo made it. Otherwise I might not have a TV still hanging on my wall right now. Uh, you know, I, I, here's the thing. I thought this game was a game of exceptions. I think that's that's as I've thought about it over the last couple of days. That's what I've said is this is a game of exceptions. Like we played okay, um, except for when you consider the number of starters we had out for the game. Then I would say that the team played pretty damn good considering who we had in there. You know, um, if, if it was all of our starters, this would have been an okay game. But given the people that were there, that being the exception, I, I thought they generally played pretty damn good, especially for what you had just mentioned of the fact that. We went in for that first quarter, and we controlled the ball for the first two-thirds of the quarter. Like, that's amazing. And the fact that we didn't get a touchdown out of that was so disheartening. Uh, You know, there were people that needed to step up uh, that did so in a really big way. I thought that we we dominated on offense, uh, or maybe not dominated, whatever one step lower than dominate is. Uh, I, I think that's whatever that is. I don't know what that word is. With the exception of not being able to finish our drives, right. you know, there was that first drive that we weren't able to finish. Then we went out and we, ha- you know, the offense had a great second drive. I think it was maybe second or third drive had another one where they controlled the clock for a really long time, and they again couldn't finish it. They couldn't put it in the end zone. Uh, I thought our defense really held their own against a, a banged up Carolina offense, except. For Greg Olson, who just seemed to have this personal force field around him that no Buccaneer could get within five feet of, you know, he was just out there alone. Like it seemed like almost every time he was on the field, uh, I thought special teams played pretty well and came up big, except for when Aguayo missed the kicks that he missed. Um, you know, but I think the biggest one to, of all of these is I kind of look through it and I mentioned this in the instant cast. If anybody got to listen to that, the biggest one to me, the biggest lesson coming out of this is the offense needs to learn how to finish and specifically to finish those drives, um, you know, because then we go into the half for this game at 17 0 instead of 6 to 0, possibly even 21 0, depending on how you looked at, at the way one of those drives finished out, um, you know, and here's the deal. If the offense finishes those drives, then we don't have two back to back game winning field goals for Ob- for Aguayo in the, the final two minutes where he misses one and comes back and makes the other. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm leaving it is the offense has to figure out how to finish uh, as an overall thought coming out of this game. Uh, and speaking of offense, Derek, why don't we go ahead and kind of break it down into those those different units? Was there anything specific you saw on offense that you want to talk about from this game? Well, it's hard to pick on the offensive line, to be honest, because they, they blocked for, uh, you know, a fifth string running back at this point, I guess, and allowed him to go over 100 yards and, and do so against a pretty decent defense, you know, and so Jameis's jersey was relatively clean. Uh, most of the time and has been to be honest this year but I think and I, I know Mark Cook mentioned this as well DeMar Dotson has not been playing good football he got his contract he's got all the capability and all the tools but he hasn't been playing particularly well and when you when you go back and look at some of the things that happen with regards to penalties while I suspect we're not one of the more penalized offensive lines it's the time of the penalties it's just killer right uh, to your point about finishing right when you think right. about the idea of being able to stab someone in the heart you get that fumble on the punt return right and you're on the mm-hmm. Carolina 30 it's a quick turn 
you've got to get points out of your quick turns. You just have to. You've got a 30-yard field to work with. Right. Right. We move down, get a first down. We're third and one on the Carolina five, and Gosser Cherlis is in as an extra blocker. Now, here's the thing. Note to any Bucks uh, front office that listen to your podcast, because they're clearly not listening to mine, because I've said this before. Oh, they get all listen to mine. Field. Every single get one of them listen to mine. The field cannot block anyone on Twitter at this point. So when right. you put Gosser Cherlis on the field, you're playing 10 on 11. Right. If your hope is to block someone, you lost. And it's worse when he gets in there and he commits a penalty. Mm-hmm. Right. So he commits a penalty, and then we follow up that penalty with a just ridiculous delay of game. Right. So we, we shoot ourselves in the foot. We're at third and 11, and then Jameis overthrows Vincent wide open on an out route, uh, which was a, a sort of a re, you know, recurrent theme in, in this particular game. Mm-hmm. But you look at that, and then we have the opportunity to miss a kick. And you come a, away from this opportunity where you know, the pa- Panthers finally figure this out a little bit, force the punt, and then you get the great turnover, and everything's like the Panthers had to be thinking at that point, what the hell else can go wrong, right? Right. Should show them at that point what, went, what, could, what else could go wrong. Uh, and, and it was stupidity. So... On the offense side of the ball, a lot of people I think are, are you know, it's funny. We actually had someone at, at the watch party have someone talk about when Glennon's going to get a chance. I knew it was going to happen <laughs> at some point. The sophomore slump discussion's already started. Jameis right. is in the future. He's inaccurate. Blah, 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 blah. I'm not sure your stance on this. I think I know it. I'm not sure of your listener stance, and I'm not sure of the uh, vociferousness of your podcast or your tone on your podcast. But here's a message for anyone who thinks that Jameis isn't the answer. You're wrong. Uh, it's not because I think I'm smarter than you. It's because I know more about this than you do, probably. And he's a damn good quarterback, and he is the face of the franchise, and he's you know phenomenal. And that's not because I'm an FSU guy, because I'm not. I don't care. But right. I've met the guy. The guy is phenomenal. Is he overthrowing the ball? Yes. Is there something broken? Absolutely. Can it get fixed? Without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah, right. and, and just so you know, Derek, the, the tone of, of this particular podcast, especially to people who would start talking like this, basically goes like this. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> so you have, I'm right there with you on, on the whole thing, talking about Jameis and a sophomore slump. And we actually talked about it last week on, on the show. It was just a little, a little tag in at the end of the show of is Jameis in a sophomore slump? And the answer was no, absolutely not. And, and for all the things you just said, yeah, there's some things that are off about him this year and he's still figuring some stuff out or he's still getting some things going, but you know, he's a, he's a great quarterback and we're just, we're going to keep riding him and that's how he's going to fix it. We're, he's not going to fix it. If we pull him out of the game and put in Glennon, that's not going to work. Uh, the only way he's going to fix it is, he, is if he stays in, keeps his head in the game, which is why I didn't have a problem a bunch of weeks ago when they didn't pull him out of the game. Twi- you know, the, the one in the rain game and then the one, uh, what was it up at Arizona? I had no problem with the fact that they didn't pull it out. Uh, and that's, that's been a lightning rod topic, actually, Brent, which is funny because I, I don't disagree with your position. I understand the opposite, right? You, you're, mm-hmm. you could get your face of the franchise hurt in meaningless time. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, Cutter comes out and says he's the captain of the ship. He wants to go down with the ship. That works great until you have your captain of the ship go down in a meaningless game in the fourth quarter, and then you're playing with Mike Lennon the rest of the year, and people are like, wow, why'd you have that happen? Right. Uh, I think you and I are cut from similar cloth. You have that happen because he's your quarterback. He got you into this position. Get us out of this position. Right. Or work your way out. Right. right. Well, you know, I said that to my four year old the other day. He was he had the he had the stroller. His little sister was in it. We were coming off the ball field and he wound up pushing her on purpose into like uh, like a little ditch. And he was coming up and I looked at him and I said the same thing that I think Cutter probably said to Jameis. And that was, well, son, you got yourself down there. Get yourself out. Right. And yeah, he kept looking at me going, help me out. And I was going, no, get yourself out. And, and I couldn't coached him through it. But that's what I mean. That's how you parent. And that's how you coach. You got yourself into that situation. Now get yourself out. And let me help you through that. Let me help you. You know, I'm going to help coach you, but you're going to have to be the one that that digs in those cleats and and uh, pushes pushes your way out of that hole that you just got yourself dug into. And there have been times over history that great quarterbacks have had days that are just not their day, right? Sure. And they and they've been sat down in the third quarter or the fourth quarter, and someone else has come in, but not with any anticipation that they weren't starting the next game. It's just this isn't your day to have you go in there and reinforce bad things is not what I want to do as a coach. It's mm-hmm. not a tactic that I would ever use, but. I checked my business card today and I am not the head coach of the Bucks. Right. Right. I'm well, you not. know, and I mean, that even plays itself out in something as stupid as fantasy football cuz for the last bunch of years, I it seems like I've always had Aaron Rodgers on at least one of my teams. And you know, he's a guy who goes out who he'll put up he consistently puts up big numbers except for the handful of games that he doesn't. And even in those games where he has big numbers, there's still the oh, he had an interception in this game or like great quarterbacks still make those mistakes. It just gets offset with 
other things that happen that are that are really really well so yeah you're right you can't and i think this last week aaron Rodgers got me like all of 15 points which is horrible for him it's horrible so um you know as far as offense for me i thought they were good but not perfect which i think is kind of what you're trying to say uh there there are some things in there that that were not great like the penalties at the most inopportune times and i don't know cutter i don't know if you heard or not Derek cutter came out uh I think it was yesterday, it might have been today, in his press conference, and he spent a, a big chunk of time talking about that, talking about how it, we only had five penalties, but they were all at the worst time possible in the game, yep. and, and we can't have that. Um, some of the positives I did think coming out of this game, I thought this might have potentially been Vincent Jackson's best game of the season that he's played so far. Um, it's a sad tribute to a player like Vincent Jackson, to be honest. I, he did yeah. his job this game. He didn't do anything spectacular. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with Vince. Uh, if I get a chance to talk with him, I'll certainly talk about it on the show because I'm fortunate enough to actually talk to him on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what's up, uh, but we're not getting the dollar value out of Vince that we should on the field. And uh, you know, I watch all 22. I even even some of the plays away from the ball, I haven't been particularly pleased with. I know him to be a man of incredibly high character. He is a, a huge competitor. So in my head, something else is going on. I don't know if there may be a, an injury, and I don't speculate on that kind of crap. Mm-hmm. All I know is what he did this game to make you think he had a good game is what you expect out of Shepard. Yeah. Right? You don't yeah. expect out of Vince. It, and th- you're, you're 100% all right on that. And for whatever's been going on with him this season, this was his best game. <laughs> you know? Um, so I thought that was a positive. And I'd, I'd be tickled to death if you get a chance to talk to him and, and he can, he'll actually tell you what's going on if he even knows you know because he he may not even really be aware of what's going on um but uh, uh so he has that going on uh i i thought everyone else was i thought they were fine um i thought they had a good albeit not perfect game uh i thought Jameis was i thought Jameis was was fine but he wasn't his star self there was a couple of star plays i thought he made uh, mike evans went out and did exactly what mike evans needed to do um but but there was there wasn't anything that I saw him flash on, if that makes sense. You know, not not in the Mike Evans that we've come to know and love, but he was solid. He did his job. He was consistent, and and I think Mike Evans has really become one of, if not our the our most consistent player on our entire offense. Um, Adam Humphreys, I thought, did fine. The offensive line, as you mentioned, I thought they they did fine, albeit not perfect. And and that's I don't know. That's the whole thing I could say about a, the offense in this particular game is. is they were good, just not perfect. I, the star of the offense, obviously, and, and everyone's talking about it this week, is Jacquez Rogers. You know, I right. thought it was right that he got the offensive game ball. Um, you know, it seems like we've all been saying it for for three weeks solid is to run him like Doug Martin, um, and they did. Uh, you know, and while he wasn't Doug Martin, he still came up big. He had, uh, I think, I saw he had thirty touches for one hundred and twenty something yards, and that's pretty good. But even then, I had to note, you know, what would happen, though? How many yards does Doug Martin get if he gets 30 touches in a game? Sure. I mean, that's easily a 200-yard game for him, right? Well, um, I, it's hard to project. I mean, that's the thing about running games, right? And we were talking about that at the, at the watch party, too, uh, because people are, of course, getting upset at the end, too conservative, blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. Three and a half yards of carry is all you need. That's all you need. If you get three and a half yards of carry, you right. never have to throw a football. That's right. Right? That's right. Uh, so, so when you're looking at game planning and what you want to do, a lot of this is dictated by what fronts you get. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the frustrations is because we don't have a blocking tight end with Luke Stocker out, and none of our tight ends that are left can actually block. If you send Goster Cherilis in, we've already talked about the stupidity of that move because he can't block and he can commit penalties. Other than that, it's great when he's out there. What you have to do to nullify defense stack in the box is you have to go into spread. You go into doubles, you go into trips, whatever. You've got to spread that defense out, so they have to declare. We talk about it all the time when you face teams that play a 3-4. Now, the Panthers don't play a 3-4, but the same uh, fundamentals apply. If they can have their linebackers all floating around the box and drop a safety down and go one deep, you can't run against that. I don't care if you're Adrian Peterson, you don't run right. against that. So so does Doug, Doug Martin get 200 yards? I don't know. I think he's a better back than Jack Wiz for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I can't wait to have him back. But I'll tell you what, I like having Jack Wiz Rogers as a, as a backup to him for sure. I oh, love absolutely. what we this kid. I liked him when he was in Atlanta, so I'm glad that he's here. Yeah. Uh, but I think their styles are, are more similar. And I think that people wanted to see what Charles Sims could do. And, and Charles is a, a good enough back for the things that he does. That's, again, not a slight to him. I like Charles mm-hmm. Sims on the roster. But if Mike James had been healthy, Mike James would have been the guy running. We would never be talking about Jack Wiz Rogers. And then we say, well, what about Mike James in, in Seattle when he ran for you know 700 yards in a quarter, right? Right. 
So right, it, it, yeah. I mean, you you take all that, and you know, it, you mentioned it just a minute ago uh, of this conservative game that a lot of people were saying that Cutter was calling. It, it, you know, and and when I was coming up, it, it, and even still, I remember even hearing the great John Gruden talk about, "Listen, you got to ride the bull. You know, if something's working, if it ain't broke, if it's still working, you just keep doing that." And it, the run game was working in this particular game for whatever reason, however well the offensive line was playing, or whatever was going on with, with the Panthers' defense that they couldn't get a stop on the guy, the run was working. So if you're in a situation where you need where you need that, you need to pick up yards, go with what's working until it stops working, and then try and then figure out something else. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was uh, – that was kind of my – those were my, my big thoughts on, on offense. They were good, but they were not perfect. Um and uh, yeah, it was it was good to see. How about defense, Derek? What you what do you see on defense tonight? On defense, I got to tell you, I've I've been proud of individuals on this team before. And as a Bucks fan, I know that I'm Bucks biased. I don't sh- shy away from it, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know that even in our heyday, I've been more proud of a Bucks defense. Yeah, uh, these guys played with a level of tenacity that that we haven't seen in a long time, and, and it wasn't spectacular. It wasn't the six sack, four turnover. You know, interception brought back for a touchdown, glamorous defense, but it was grind it out, do what you have to do, get the job done defense by a bunch of guys, some of whom probably shouldn't be wearing NFL jerseys, right? right. And when when Mike Smith can get his team to do that, it's phenomenal. And and I think as a Bucks fan, you have to be excited because we should be getting some of these groceries back, right? right? How does the game look if Clinton McDonald's in or Clinton McDonald and Gerald McCoy are in, right? Right. What what changes? Because we were able to do this with guys who normally don't get the reps, right? We just simply could not generate a pass rush. Right. So so for me on the defensive side of the ball, as far as individuals who popped out, I, I like the continued evolution of Will Golston. Uh, I think he's playing very good football. I saw he got dinged up a little bit, but it didn't look like it was bad. He stayed in through the injury, right. which was good. I don't think he had a choice because we had to go to a three four. I think at that point we didn't have any. <laughs> right. I think Vernon Hargraves continues to improve. I'm I'm mystified by what's happened to Alteron Werner. I think Brent Grimes, you know, a, a very uh, a popular whipping boy on this mm-hmm. team for for various reasons, most of which related to his wife and his contract, not related to his play on the field. Uh, you know, finally got a chance to really play. And, and Coach Cutter came out and made the point, which I thought was great. Everyone talks about the interception he made, which was terrific, and mm-hmm. finally shut yeah. up the newscasters about how tall the receivers were versus our short cornerbacks when he jumped out of the gym and made the pick. Right. No one was talking about until Coach Cutter said the tackle he made to set up that play. Right. Right. And so you look at a guy who's, who's like I said, he's much maligned. I'm sure he gets tired of that crap. Uh, I thought he played, played pretty doggone football, pretty doggone good football. And everyone was, you know, in their fits. Uh, Conti was Conti from time to time. McDougal had his best game as a buck, I think. I think in general, I could not be more pleased with the defense, Ben. Yeah, and honestly, Derek, I think you just read exactly what my notes are, are on here. The defense didn't dominate this game. But they held their own, and the word that I used to describe the defense this week is grit. They all had grit. They stayed in it. Um, yeah, they didn't fall apart. Uh, they did what they had to do, um, especially, as you said, considering all the guys that, that are out. And you mentioned Clint McDonald and Jordan McCoy and even Robert Ayers. You know, what happens when those guys come back in? Uh, if everybody's clicking and everybody's understanding this defense that Mike Smith's in, that, that people seem to be getting Mike Smith a whole bunch of crap for four games into the season of – you know, he's not able to, to coordinate our defense. Let's get rid of him already, which is dumb. Uh, you know, we had what? John- wait, a minute. wait, wait, wait. You mean to say that some people are dumb when they. Yeah, you're right. It's very I dumb. am absolutely saying that. It's incredibly I'm, stupid. I'm it's absolutely incredibly saying stupid. that. Uh, you know, John Hughes stepped off the street this this week. You know, he was he was cut by. Was it the Bears or something like that? Um, and, uh, you know, we brought him in and he he got injured. In the middle of the game, had to go out, and he turned around and came back in. And we signed him on what Wednesday of last week, I think it was. I mean, he's I don't, I don't know that he actually had a contract. I think that we just had something scribbled on a napkin at uh, Perkins, paying him under the table, no taxes taken out. That's what's going exactly. on with him this week. So yeah. you know, you had that. I thought you know Vernon Hargraves this week to me, I think was Vernon Hargraves like his big test. And they, you know, they had him on Kelvin Benjamin the entire game, stayed with him, and I thought he passed this test. You know, Kelvin Benjamin, he's a fantastic receiver for the Panthers, and and he got, you know, he picked off some of his own passes, and and that was great. But Hargrave stayed with him, and I thought he he passed this big test with it. To me, it was at least a solid A minus. 
you know, Grimes, as you mentioned to him, he's finally doing what we're paying him to do. And, you know, I, I, I have been on the, the, the bashing Brent Grimes train for a little bit of, uh, have nothing to do with Miko and, and more to do with his plays. You know, if you're slipping three times in the end zone and, uh, missing tackles and having no interceptions i'm i'm wondering what's going on with you and i'd said uh what was it last week i think i said he's on my shit list until until he makes an interception i don't care what he does and so uh I, and i think that was probably true for a lot of bucks fans until we actually saw the interception you know he'd go out and make all the great plays i wanted to see that interception which is i think why so many fans are keying in on that but it's a fantastic point that he also had a great tackle at the one yard line to set up that play uh, cause if he doesn't have that tackle, then they got a, then they get a touchdown and he wouldn't even had a chance for that. So for, for a guy of his stature, I think he's tackled pretty effectively all year. I think he's a guy who, uh, like Rondé Barber in the past will take on contact at the, at the line to turn plays inside. I think a lot of times fans don't understand the way defensive schemes work. And they think that who first guy there is supposed to make the tackle. When first guy there isn't always supposed to make the tackle. Sometimes his job is to take outside edge away from the guy who's running the ball to force him to help. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of cornerbacks get into that that abuse pattern where they'll go and Akeem Talib did that when he was here too. Akeem Talib was a surprisingly good tackler, mm-hmm. uh, but more impressive than that was he had a very high football IQ. And I heard them talking about that the other day on another broadcast. You've got to get there and turn a play to help. Now when help gets there, they've got to make the play. And one of the problems with our defense right now is where our cornerbacks have stepped up significantly across the board, even with the the Bermuda Triangle of Alteron Werner, the the cornerbacks in general have been much, much better in almost every aspect of the game, but our safeties are so absolutely terrible mm-hmm. in almost every facet of the game at this point for whatever reason, be it mysterious or injury or lack of talent. I don't know. It's probably a combination of all of them that I think that a number of these cornerback plays are, are squarely on the safeties and no defensive coordinator can come out there and say that and no player is going to come out there and sell their, their brother out. But you just got to keep an eye on if If you see a cornerback running with someone back in the, you know, on a post deep, Chances are we weren't running cover zero across and leaving a cornerback out there, mm. right? Chances are there's a safety who bit on something. But right. anyways, I well, didn't mean to. Well, wait, what you're forward. describing, no, what you're describing right there is exactly what we saw, I think, was with Altron Werner uh, last week, wasn't it? Or, or maybe two weeks ago. Yep, uh, two weeks I ago. mean, it was, it, was, it was like his the first play of the game that they were out there, and that's exactly, exactly what we'd seen yep. in that moment, um, exactly what you're describing. Now, it was all, a thinly veiled reference to that very play in <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently it wasn't that thin. Uh, <laughs> Nothing about me is, brother. <laughs> there, you and me both, man. Uh, but, you know, you talk about the safeties, and, like, you go back to this particular game. Let's bring it back there. All three of our safeties that played this week had big plays. You know, they may, they may have not had dominated throughout the entire game, but Conti certainly came in and, and said, oh, he actually can play this position sometimes. And Keith Tandy had a big one, and, and my favorite part of that was when he got up the this this guttural roar that he let out that you're like, oh, hey, welcome to the team, Tandy. Um, you know, and even Bradley McDougald, he was around. So they forced turnovers, the defense did, and they did really what we asked of them. So, um, yeah, I, I like what you said. The defense, you know, we this is a defense uh, to be proud of for this particular game Absolutely. with what we have here. All right, how about special teams? What do you What do you have for us there? So outside of uh, Mr. Aguayo, I am very pleased with our special teams effort thus far. Our, our special teams return team is, is what it is. Adam Humphreys is, has proven himself to be someone who's dangerous, which is fine. Uh, but it's not like we're, you know, in the, in the days of uh, great returners. Uh, Anger is, he has the right name for a punter. He's, he kicks the hell out of the ball. I like what he does. He positions it well. He gives us a chance to cover. Shepard is a beast on special teams, and I'm just waiting for him to get more play at wide receiver. I think in general, special teams are great. I, uh, during the game, uh, did some instant uh, broadcasts on uh, Periscope through Twitter, mm-hmm. and I, I appreciate the data that people have gotten on Sebastian Janikowski to talk about his first year. Mm-hmm. I have a real problem with kickers in general, probably because I'm just a grizzled old football guy. Uh, you've got one job. I don't know how he can continue to miss, to be honest. Uh, I don't know that he's an upgrade. Now, could he be an upgrade after his 15-year career a la Sebastian Janikowski, which I think is actually 12, but um, possibly. But right now, he puts us in a bad position, not only when he misses the kicks, but the fact that he has missed the kicks, because I guarantee you, and Coach Cutter will never come out and say it, nor would the coaching staff before him, if you're afraid your kicker's going to miss, you will call your game differently. You simply will. You will try not to put yourself in the position to have him come out and kick. It, it will be... 
under the in the back of your mind the entire time of do I really want to try a 48 yard field goal? No, I don't. I really don't. And it's going to change what you do on fourth down sometimes. Mm-hmm. And and I just hate that. And so I'm glad he made the game winner because if he hadn't, uh, I don't know if the the guy would have been on. They would have Lane Kiffin him, right? He may not have gotten on the plane. Right. But uh, uh, until they can fix that, and I don't know how you fix it. Like I've I've said, get him drunk, uh, hookers, whatever you got to do. <laughs> get his mind off it. The kid can kick a football. We know he can. Right. Uh, but but until he's consistent, uh, it's it's a problem for special teams. It's going to fall on their shoulders. And right now, every time we come out to kick, I'm scared. Yeah. Well, you know, and Cutter has even talked about that. He he has said several times in his press conferences that he plays the percentages. And if Aguayo's percentages are down and he's got a better percentage to to pass the ball and, and make it uh, or or run the ball and, and pick up another first down or or even get it in the end zone, um, then then he's he's at least got to look at it. And you're right. You call your game different when uh, uh, when you can depend on that. And yeah, it, everything was great. You know, Brian Inger did a great job. Um you know, Russell Shepard, I'll tell you what I liked about Russell Shepard on that fumble recovery was the fact he fought for it. You know, the, the Panthers player, and I don't, I don't know who it was. I, I forget, but he Ted. was, he was all, it was a Ted Ginn. Is that who it yeah. was? Yeah. He was all of a foot away from the ball. Shepard was at least five feet away and he dove for it. He fought for it. And that's, and I, I just, I thought watching that replay probably three or four times. That's why he's the captain right there. That's why Russell Shepard is the captain on the special teams because he steps up, he made something happen. Um, you know, Aguayo, I agree with everything that you're saying. Um, and he made the kick when he absolutely had to, when it came down to it. And like, like you, I don't know what's going on with, with Roberto Aguayo. And I, I, don't, I think I might lean more towards the side of this seems normal for a kicker um, and – you still every time he misses a kick, you sit there and go, "You have one job." Yep. You have you don't have to you don't have to snap the ball. You don't have to catch the ball. You don't have to hold the ball. You don't have to position the ball. You don't you don't have to worry about blocking. You have one job is to well, and, to and, just and kick the ball. To your point and your question about special teams, our long snapper has been doing a great job. DePaul's doing a great job. Our holder's been doing a great job. It's not like yeah. he's got a slew of bad snaps and bad holds. Right. Right. He's just got to kick the ball. Right. And I, the, the tweet of the night for me was someone tweeted if, uh, and he gave a Twitter handle is available, and I hit the Twitter handle, and it was Morton Anderson's Twitter handle, and I just yeah. lost it because Morton's 87 and probably could still kick for 80% with, you know, inside of 40 yards. Right. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> – there you go. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think I still come down to a while. This is normal for great kickers in their first year. Like, I, I hate to say it, and – the flip side of what that means is that means that for this first year and potentially even the second year, if you're going to stick with Aguayo and we're going to ride the roller coaster, and that's what I've been telling people to do is listen, just buckle in. Aguayo is going to be our kicker. Just ride the roller coaster. There's there's going to be times when he makes it. There's going to be other times when he doesn't. And let's ride the roller coaster because in a in a in a year or two, he's going to be fantastic. Um, un- unless he just completely implodes, but odds are he's going to be fantastic and until then that's when the rest of our team has to step up and I hate to say that because you don't want to sit there and give a guy a season or two to get his shit together you know you you definitely don't want to do that but just looking at what other great kickers have done because it's not just Janikowski uh dude up in uh uh, New England um Goss I don't know. All these kickers have hard names to, yeah, all these kickers have bad names to pronounce, but, um, you know, I mean, same thing when you look at at some of his, uh, his deals. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, special teams, I think, I think did fine with the exception of those mystic wild kicks and there's, and there's no excuse for him. That that's the other, like, I'm so torn on that, on that bit of a it, It just seems normal for a rookie, but there's no excuse. Like, but I'm not going to fly off the handle and say, let's cut him and get somebody else in here. I, I'm I'm not going to go that far with that, but I don't know. Uh, I think, I think the challenge is you have to, you have to look at extra points too. And and this is one of the things I think is maybe compounding this problem. Mm-hmm. When they moved the extra point back, it now became a field goal, right? right? Extra points were almost unmissable in the past, which is why they changed the rule. Right. So now for guys like Steven Goskowski and Adam Vinatieri and, and Sebastian Janikowski, so I just looked up Vinatieri. He was 77% his first year. Goskowski was 76%. Now, those are all field goals, right? They don't really take into consider extra points. Right. Now, the extra points were 44 of 43 for Goskowski, right? 
for Vinatieri this first year, 42 of 39 from like a foot and a half away. Right. So now we don't get a chance to see uh, Aguayo just miss the occasional field goal when it's you know 40 to 50 yards. We get a chance to see him kick a legitimate field goal every time he's taking an extra point. Mm-hmm. So I think that for us to do it, and I was just as pissed off. I was like, take his pads anyway. Damn him. He's just a kicker. Go sign someone else. Who gives a crap? But I, I, I have to agree and err on the side of patience. We've invested in him. He mm-hmm. has a lineage, and he's got, he's got tape. Right? He's proven he could do it. There's a reason they went to the right hash. Right. That's where he likes to kick in college. Put him where he's comfortable. Right? It, it looked like a college play. Most right. of the time, you take that extra snap. In the NFL, you try and center the kick. Right? We mm-hmm. didn't. We went to the right hash, right. which was amazingly funny to me. But I think that your point is a good one. I think what may be exacerbating the situation, though, is that we get all of these extra cuts watching kickers actually kick field goals that aren't considered field goals, and they're missing them. And I think it's going to change coaching you know, at, at the event when Coach Cutter went for two. You know, Some people that were really upset about that because there's that grid that everyone's supposed to use. You only go for two in the fourth quarter inside the <laughs> right. six minutes. Blah, 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 connect four. There's a lot of good math that tells you you should always go for two. Yeah. Right? Uh, and we, I don't know if you've ever seen this. I think it's a, a team in Stanford or in California. It's a high school team. The, the coach always onside kicks, never punts, and always goes for two. And he's won, like, I don't know, 300 out of 307 games. Now, it's at the yeah. high school level, obviously, so it's different. But he's done, the math is there. There are graduate programs on it, mm-hmm. right? That this battle of field position that people talk about is not really borne out by mathematics. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I think Dirk Cutter should start onside kicking every time. Uh, and never punting, et cetera, et cetera. But I have no problem with him making that two-point conversion call, uh, other than the fact that we have not been notorious this season for being good in the red zone. Right. And, you know, it, 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 I don't know what you, I'm glad you said that because I didn't know that. And that harkens back to my days playing ball where I, I always hated having to come off for a punt or having to come off for, for something else. I just always wanted to go for it no matter what. Always wanted to go, even two point two point conversions. Always, you know, but that was that was my happy fat lineman ass. Uh, <laughs> try, try, I just wanted to be out there, and and there was some, you know, some JV guy that they promoted that they wanted to get uh, get playing time that they always brought in for for those kind of special team things that took me out. But uh, well, Derek, I tell you what, for the sake of time, uh, let's move on to final thoughts and grades. So, do you have any final thoughts as we head into the bye week and and looking at San Francisco coming up? And what grades would you give the team? the offense, the defense, special teams, and then the overall grade for the team? Uh, I think the defense has to get an A. Uh, if I could give A pluses, but I didn't come up in a plus system. So uh, even at UCF, we didn't really use pluses and minuses right. when I went to school. So I'm going to give them an A, which is as high a grade as I can give them. I, sure, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more pressure on the passer, but overall I, can't, I couldn't ask any more from that defense than what they did. Uh, on offense, I would say I'm going to give them a C, uh, even though they ran the ball effectively. I think that Mike Evans, you know, a lot of the people were like, well, how did Julio Jones go for 500 yards against this defense? They were in cover two most of the night. Uh, there was a play that has become mildly infamous at some points, and I'll talk about it a lot on my show tomorrow as well, that John Gruden was berating Jameis Winston about and, and hearkened to it. Hey, he's hearkened three times tonight. That's terrible. <laughs> uh, referred to it is a better use. Uh, when we went for the third and nine draw, uh, where he tried to get to Mike Evans, against cover two. He's like, you can't do that against cover two. You got safety over the help. You threw him into coverage. Okay, that's not true. It was cover two with press with an Oompa Loompa in front of Mike Evans. <laughs> right. He gets around him, and it's complete. He's got a, a seven-yard window to complete. If they didn't let that guy uh, sexually assault him, a la Donald Trump, for seven yards, right? that's a completion, and everyone's singing a different tune. So anyway, uh, on the offensive side of the ball, I'll give them a C because I don't think that we were able to dictate very much. Uh, but, you know, Rodgers was amazing. Special teams, I'm going to give us a, a solid uh, B because I can't bring the whole team down because uh, Guayo can't do the one thing he's supposed to do. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of – my grades are a little bit off but pretty close to what you had there. I, I'm giving the offense a B-. minus. Uh, I did come up in minuses and pluses, so uh, <laughs> I'm giving the offense a B-. minus. Like I said, I, I thought they were good. They certainly were not perfect, though, uh, and they have to finish drives. And But the way that they controlled the clock, especially on those first couple of drives, is I I have to give them major, major points for that. Uh, defense, I'm giving an A-. minus. Um, again, you, you mentioned there was no pass rush, and certainly understanding who we had in there, but still, uh, I thought they they performed admirably. A- minus for them. Special teams, I'm giving them a B. Uh, which kind of, I guess, brings my overall grade to a to a B plus. I, I don't know if that's how you average those or not. 
Um, and, and as far as a final thought as we head into San Francisco, really to me right now, it's just about getting healthy. And I think that's probably true for everybody uh, across the board. You know, getting as many of our starters back as we can as we head into the rest of the season where there is no more break. There is no more bye week coming up once we get past this. So uh, get our guys healthy, get them back. Um, you know, we're 0-1 on the corner and on the quarter, and the 49ers are a bad team. And I know that other people are saying that the Buccaneers are also a bad team. So we can't afford to take this game lightly. We can't afford to sit back and just think that the Niners game is going to be uh, a, a game that's in that in the bag because it's not. I think we're going to go out there. I think it's. I think they're going to give us a bigger test than I think what a lot of people are hoping. Um, but uh, certainly getting our guys healthy to get out there is uh, paramount. Do you have any thoughts heading into the San Francisco game? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this is the infirmary week. I think when we saw the schedule, it was always you always get upset when you see the buy that early because you're hoping you have one later because you expect the injuries to pile up. Mm-hmm. It was fortuitous for us because we had so many injuries that are impactful to this team to get them healthy. And now you know you, you really have to lean on the training staff to say, okay, you got your you know you got your one get out of jail free card with an early bye week. Get these guys healthy, but you better keep them taped up and running through the rest of the season. Uh, I I would love to know. Why fans still in this day and age think there's such a thing as an easy game? I don't understand why fans don't understand that parody in the NFL is in fact a real thing. It's not just a, you know, a, a, a kind of knife that you use, like a paring knife. Mm-hmm. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers are an NFL team. They'll come out and they'll play well. We're going to play Colin Kaepernick uh, instead of uh, the the uh, <laughs> the non-starting wonder, as Sean King used to probably refer to. <laughs> uh, and no one knows what 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 Kaepernick's going to do in this offense, right? This is a guy who's playing for a lot, uh, right. not just the field, but but on the grand stage because of the things that he's done this season. So mm-hmm. you're going to play a different kind of quarterback than, than what has been on film this year for the 49ers. So, uh, you know, 0-1 in the quarter, like you said, you ended up the, we ended up the first quarter not where we wanted to be. Um, or 1-0, rather, on the, on the second quarter. Right. Um, but, but at this point, every game is critical. You can't take for granted a single thing because we have to stack wins. It's great that the two wins are against division teams, right? Mm-hmm. That's phenomenal. Um, but, you know, you go and you crap the bed against the Rams who turned out to be, oh, wow, they don't suck. Look at the Rams today. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just one of those things where they've got to get out there. And, and I think that this will give the guys in the lab some time, Mike Smith some time with his guys, to look at what's going on and start tweaking things and do the best he can with these safeties, for God's sakes. Uh, Coach Cutter, to, to see what he's able to do, to look at the drive where we went down the field from the 20, I guess, to, to a touchdown in like five throws and see how can we do more of that if we need to. Uh, while dictating at the same time and maybe get some health. So that's what I'm looking forward to. I'd love to see a healthy defense, the healthy version of our defense play with the intensity sustained over the entire game the way they did against Carolina. I think we'll we'll let that wrap up the segment. Um, and well, now, guys, we'd like to know what your thoughts are on our thoughts, especially on on the way Derek just put a nice little capstone on the end of that, uh, end of that segment. Uh, you can do that by sending an email to the pewtercast at gmail.com, or you can tweet or Facebook us at the pewtercast. We do respond to each piece of communication we get. So send them on in. Well, guys coming up, uh, coming up next off this win that we had, uh, Derek and I are going to be discussing our top three clutch bucks players or impact bucks players, that have helped really, uh, that, that helps wins. Um, and I can't wait to see what Derek has for us on that. So stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. One, two, three, four, one. Hey Bucks fans, Brent Allen, your host here, and I just wanted to take a minute to give you guys a heads up to something that is coming up here on the Pewtercast. As I'm sure you're aware, next week is the bye week, and I was trying to put my brain to how are we going to do the bye week? We've never done one before. This is our first year. And here's what we came up with. We are going to take our most famous segment, the best segment that we have called Fan to Fan Live, and we're going to do the whole show, nothing but Fan to Fan Live. And for the very first time, we are going to go live with the show. And you're going to be able to call in or send in a voicemail and you will get your voice here right on the Pewtercast. You can call in. You can talk to me about any topic concerning the Bucks that you want. You can tell me uh, whether you agree or disagree with anything that we've been saying here on the show. And uh, here's how that's going to happen. Next Wednesday night, October the 19th, 2016 at 9 p.m. You can call into the show. We'll get the details out about that here 
uh, very, very shortly. But you can call into the show live. It's the only time that we're going to be going live this year that we know of. Or you can just send a voice memo. You do a voice memo on your phone. You email it over to me at the Pewtercast. We'll make sure we get those played. But it'll be an entire episode of just Fan to Fan Live. You can call in live or you can pre-record it and send it in. Either way, we'd love to get your input into the show. Again, that's next week, October 19th, 2016 at 9 p.m. We will be going live with the show. But for now, back to this show. Welcome back, PewterCast fans. It is now time for our top three segment. Well, Derek, I'm going to toss it to you first. Uh, we're talking about our top three clutch players or impact players for the Bucks. Did you have any criteria that you were used in picking your top three, and what is your number three pick? Well, the criteria I used was uh, impact plays, right? Now, the, the interesting piece is one of these guys who made the top three, it was a, a accumulation of impact plays, and I, I think that the names we picked will probably be the same. Um, but I've got uh, an offensive guy, a defensive guy, and a special teams guy, and I don't think that any of them will be a surprise. My number three pick is Brent Grimes. Uh, you know, stopping that touchdown was so critical, the tackle beforehand and then the interception. In general, I thought he played a good game, but those two plays, those sort of penultimate moments, he, he stepped up, right? We were on the big stage with a game that people had already cast as a must-win, and here's the guy you brought in and gave a bunch of money who'd been playing a little bit below where people expected, and bam, bam. He makes two plays back to back. He's my number three impact player of the week. Yeah, Brent Grimes. Uh, he certainly he certainly did it, um, and, and he had it, man. I think that's a I think that's a fantastic pick. Um, for my criteria uh, now, for me, I was I was looking at it, and I I kept limiting everything to this game or even this season, and then I stopped and I said, why am I doing that? Uh, so I actually opened up my list to any Buck player, whether they're currently on the roster or not, maybe a past player. Um, but I also realized in doing so that that could mean a lot of research and I wasn't ready to do that kind of research. So, uh, <laughs> so I kind of stayed with, with really just who is, who is top of mind, who is, who is fresh in my brain when I think about this idea, uh, which of course is going to mean that, that a lot of the, there are just a lot of the guys that, uh, are currently playing, um, but you know, cut clutch or impact to me just means that they come through in big ways, and the reason they come through in big ways is because they're consistent. Um, and, you know, I kind of just I had to remember them as someone who just came through in clutch times. The other thing, too, is I, I have a penalty box and in my penalty box, I put everyone who's in the ring of honor or that kind of came out of that that golden era. You know, the the Warren Saps and Derek Brooks, Ronde Barbers, Mike Allstotts. Um, you know, those those kinds of guys. And I know Barber's not in the ring of honor yet, but he will be. Um, sure. Uh, so I just I kind of I set them aside like they they don't qualify for for my most of my list anymore because I I would talk about them way too often. Uh, so with that said, my number three is a guy who is currently on our roster and he had a huge play in this last game, and uh, it, it comes back to even even Dirk Cutter in uh, camp had had said. I really keep wanting to not like this guy. I keep wanting to cut this guy, but I just can't. And I'm talking about Russell Shepard, captain of our special teams unit. Uh, that play that he made to me, and I went back and I watched it on DVR probably probably four or five times, where he was so far away from the ball, and he went in and he he owned that ball. I don't care how far Ted Ginn was away from it. He was not getting it. He, he was not giving it up, and it was his ball. And... I I know that we didn't come out of that next deal with a big score or anything, but still that was so huge and he just makes an impact and he is a guy who's going to cause turnovers and is going to cause, um, uh, he's going to cause big plays. So for me, my number three pick, uh, for this list is Russell Shepard. Uh, so yeah, Derek, what'd you have as number two, man? So for number two on my list, uh, you know, this comes up to the, the accumulation effect, if we don't have the running game that we have in that game, uh, it's a very different story that we're telling. And with Jacquez Rogers coming in there and running the ball as effectively as he did, getting over 100 yards, 30 carries, we joked around during the game that he was going to challenge James Wilder's single-game carry record. 
if they kept riding him like a horse. And I think if he hadn't tweaked something for a little while and let Peyton Barber get in there a couple plays, uh, he might have. So I'm going to give it to Jacquez Rogers, our number two uh, impact player of the week. Yeah, that number two. Yeah, Jacquez Rogers is certainly he's an honorable mention for me. And he was almost so obvious that I, I just couldn't put him on this list. Uh, but I and I kind of figured you would. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad to see him there. He certainly uh, you, you know what? I think we like Jacquez Rogers so much, especially for those of us who are, are podcasters or, or people that do any kind of uh, recapping on the bucks is because I think we've all mostly been saying for the last couple of weeks, Jacquez Rogers is going to run this ball. Jacquez Rogers can do this. Uh, and the fact that he went out and did it was, was absolutely fantastic. Um, my number two guy is also a guy who is currently on our roster and he almost made my penalty box to be honest with you. Um, because it's, it's just another guy who is also so it's so obvious, but I couldn't ignore it. Um, and I'm 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 looking at the collective work of this guy of the body of work that this guy has put on the field since he's been part of our team, and I'm talking about our quarterback, which is Jameis Winston. Uh, the even in this game, there there are things that I've not seen a lot out of him this year that harken back to a lot of those things that we saw last year. Like there are a couple of plays where he got out and he just kept the ball and and took off on a little jog down the field and picked up. Um, you know, five, six, seven yards. Uh, there were, there were times where, uh, I watched him stay cool and calm collected, even though he had a little bit of pressure coming towards him, uh, whether people got past the offensive line or, or, you know, they blitzed in or, or whatever it happened. Um, but regardless of that, Jameis Winston is still the leader of this team, you know, for, for all the times he may be overthrowing a player or, um, he may be making some of those mistakes that we've seen him make this year. He's still the leader of this team and he is keeping everybody together. He's keeping, uh, he's keeping the team calm. And, and I watched him do that in a way for this particular game that I don't know that we've seen in the last couple of games. You know, even the, the, the television announcers are talking about, people are talking about Jameis coming out being too, too emotional, especially early in the game. And I felt like this week, particularly, he just had so much more control over that, that it helped the team as a whole. So that's why Jameis Winston makes it in as my number two pick. Well, let's get down to our nitty gritties. Derek, what do you have as your number one pick top impact player for the bucks? Well, I, I think that I didn't really have a choice. Uh, I'm not sure who you picked. You've gone with the, the less obvious choices, which I can respect. I normally do that on my uh, predictive MVPs, but uh, I think that you have to give it to the guy who won the game. And you could argue that he also almost lost the game twice. But I think that you've got to go with Roberto Aguayo, especially coming back after the misses, after the tumultuous season he's had so far, knowing the amount of pressure that's on him. Uh, he's missed shorter kicks than this. And so to come up on Monday Night Football as a rookie with all of the pressure of the world on his shoulders and uh, drill that kick, uh, I think it was pretty impressive. And I think in, in a lot of ways, uh, without that, right, I don't know psychologically that this team rebounds. Uh, and, and I don't know what overtime ends up looking like. Yeah, no, I think I think that's a that's a that's a great pick. And the only thing that I can say to that is uh, hashtag I'm with 19. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's hashtag I'm with 19 because I I wholeheartedly agree with you there. Well, for my number one pick, I'm actually reaching several years back and I mean several years back. And this one here's the deal. I have zero data to support this. I have no stats to, to back me up and, and to say what I'm saying is right. This is purely something coming out of memory. Um, this is more of a of a of a happy pick for me, and I really like saying this guy's name. And so for me, my number one pick, and I'm not saying that he is the most clutch player we've ever had. I'm just saying he's the guy that I think of when I think of this because I just I I seem to remember him always coming up with a big play at the right time and being super consistent. And I'm talking about a wide receiver that was on our team a bunch of years ago by the name of Joe Juravicious. Uh, now, I don't know if you remember him or not, Derek. I, I assume you probably do. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> he, uh, I don't, it, yeah, I don't know. I think I said everything about him. He's, I, I can't support why I feel like he's this big clutch player, except when he was on our team, I don't recall ever seeing him drop a ball. I don't, I I, re I recall him being in traffic, having a couple of defenders on him and him still in a, in a Mike Evans-esque way, plucking the ball out of the air and grabbing it. And he, w he was just consistent. 
every time. And, and Derek, I'll let you speak to that to tell me if I'm crazy, wrong or not. But uh, I think I'm going to stand by my number one of Joe Jervicious. You know, it's interesting. Joey J uh, is one of those guys who endeared himself to this town quickly. He only played here for three seasons. Uh, and I think he only had like 30 catches in his three seasons total. But there are or, or 30 games rather, not 30 catches. Uh, so the, the thing about Joey, though, is in the Super Bowl run, the play against the Eagles, the drag route that was so critical to turn that game around. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a catch the next year when we, you know, because we, we closed uh, their old stadium. We opened their new stadium with victories. He had this right. ridiculous acrobatic catch in that game as well. He was that guy that you always want uh, in the slot. Uh, he was a tall slot guy. He was a tall, fast kid who just went in there and didn't care about contact. He was he was blue collar, right? People right. like blue collar football players. Uh, and what's funny about that is you had a you had a guy like Keyshawn Johnson who was not a blue collar uh, attitude or or impression, but played like a blue collar player. He he mm-hmm. caught ball hit. So you know I love the Joey J pick. I think he's a, a fan favorite for sure. Uh, and I hate the fact that he ended up going on to Seattle and then for two years in Cleveland to to lament instead of staying here. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, that'll, I think that'll wrap up those, uh, Derek, do you have any honorable mentions? Maybe guys who didn't quite make your list for tonight. No, it's, it's interesting. I, I like the difference in the way you, you took impact. Like I would not have thought of someone outside of this game, right? Cause I, I love what you said about Jameis. I agree. I think that there are, uh, sort of these, uh, unmeasurables that you have to put into a quarterback evaluation. And the fact that he is the unquestioned leader of this team, uh, you watched it in the huddle or in the in the game ball presentation. He had Jacquez Rogers up on his chest, holding him up in the air, and mm-hmm. you know you've seen that of James the whole time. So I love that. Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think that there's probably some guys that we don't know about that are that are back there, uh, like the Ronde Barbers of the past. Ronde Barber was not a vocal leader. That's not what he did. He wasn't right. the guy who got there rah rah and chant and do that stuff. That was Sap. That was Simeon. That was Derek at times, right? That was John Lynch, to be honest, at mm-hmm. times. I would love I would love over time as we get to learn this new generation of Bucks to find out who those guys are, whether they're going to be the Quan Alexanders, Levante Davids. Uh, you know, Clint McDonald looked like he was trying to take that role, and if he stays healthy, I think he can. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'd love to know those guys. But no, I, I think that I covered the ones that I want um, for, for this particular segment. Yeah, I, I'm going to just throw a couple out there, and, and I think this is where I'm going to take my penalty box away, and I'm just going to say everybody who's ever been in the Ring of Honor or who will be in the future – is a clutch player. They're an impact player for the team, and and that's why they're in the Ring of Honor. Um, and, and I can't discount them wholly. I think Mike Evans is quickly becoming that guy. Um, certainly, we have seen those flashes throughout the year, but what I see coming out of Mike Evans right now is consistency, and I think that's becoming the key for him. And that might even turn into what the you know, if you you look at the theme of his second year, it was all the dropped passes, even though he did better on all of his numbers except for touchdowns. Um, I think the theme of his year this year might be consistency. Uh, also, as you say, Clint McDonald, I think, is a guy um, that can can be real sneaky when it comes to to coming into some clutch plays. A- Akeem Spence, honestly, I think is a guy who currently, um, when he shows up, he shows up big. So, uh, yeah, those are just kind of a couple guys that I had that uh, had just sort of missed the list that that I was tossing around as to whether or not I wanted them on there. Well, fans, uh, I want to know now, how do your picks stack up against ours? Was there a player that we missed or or was there something else that you wanted to add? Or or do you think we were just completely foolish to put the people on there that we did? Well, you can let us know by connecting with us on Twitter at the Pewtercast or on Facebook.com forward slash the Pewtercast. Or for those of you that might be a little bit more winded, feel free to shoot us an email to the Pewtercast at gmail.com. And Derek, before we get out of here, why don't we take a look at this week's poll? It's real bad. Okay? I don't like those numbers at all. Just one poll? Those things aren't scientific. Yes, they are. All this is is science. This is math. Well, in this week's poll, uh, we thought we had we would actually really narrow this one down to say which player made the biggest impact on Monday night. And the options that we gave you, because Twitter only allows us four, was Jameis, Winston, Jacquez Rogers, Vernon Hargraves, or we left it open as a write-in option. Derek, uh, man, let me throw it to you. I don't know if you got a chance to vote in the poll or, or even saw it out there, but uh, where would you pick? Where w- what would you choose if you had to pick between these guys or you're right in? Uh, I think it's it's Jacquez Rogers. Well, uh, you say Jacquez, and 84% of the people who responded also voted for Jacquez, which clearly makes him the winner. And uh, 
Yeah, Jameis came in at 3%, Vernon came in at 5 and 8% of the people picked the write-in option. A lot of them writing in Jaquiz Rogers. <laughs> so, wow. <laughs> whatever that works. What a sad tribute to the world. <laughs> There's a few people that said uh, Bradley McDougal. A lot of people actually wrote in uh, Brent Grimes, which uh, made me a little bit happy. Uh, one person actually said the offensive line. No individual, just the whole offensive line. So, hey, you'll take that for what it's worth. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this segment. Coming up next, Derek and I are going to get some things off our chest as we close out the show with a little segment called Fan to Fan Live. Stay tuned. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash the pewtercast. With over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. The title this month that I am recommending is Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmule. It is the story of Pixar and how he and John Lasseter created a winning culture at that company and then took that culture and translated it to Disney animated studios. You can use your free audio download to get creativity Inc by Ed Catmule by signing up at audibletrial.com forward slash the pewtercast. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash the pewtercast for your free audio book. Welcome back, Bucks fans. If you've been listening to this show for any time at all, you are probably familiar with this segment by now. It has become a fan favorite, and oddly, it is called Fan to Fan Live. And this is basically where Derek and I are just going to sit back like we're hanging out at a bar, having a beer, and uh, just kind of talk unscripted about certain things that are on our chest related to the Bucks. So, uh, Derek, um, let's go with you first, man. What do you got for us? Well, it, it's interesting, you know, with the coaching changes and for anyone who followed my podcast knows that I'm not a fan of the way we've been making changes like people change underwear. Uh, there's a lot of uh, unrest in the village uh, when the team started to turn down. Right. And then when this game looked like it was getting out of hand, when the Panthers came back after halftime, looked like they made adjustments. All of a sudden, looked like we had fallen apart. There was a lot of noise everywhere about Coach Cutter. To be honest, Coach Cutter's done some things well. I like Coach Cutter. I like his attitude, his demeanor. I think he's going to end up becoming a heck of a head coach at some point. Uh, whether I think it was early or not is not really the point of this conversation. But the the chatter about ultra conservative versus too aggressive is one of those things that I wish and and I say this all the time, Brent. But and I know that I say it to an, an empty void. But I wish people would just take a step back away from their keyboards and stop making decisions based on 120 characters uh, all the damn time. You know, right. because he had a point. The intention was to keep his defense fresh. It wasn't going to work all the time. You're going to get some three and outs. It's going to happen. Right. But for every time that someone said, oh, wow, imagine that. We ran on first and second down. You have two choices, run or pass. It's a coin flip, for God's sakes. And one of them is more common than the other for, from a conservative perspective and for what he was trying to do and to burn clock. It just it kills me. It's almost like people feel as though – if they don't tweet something or they don't get their opinion out there, the world's going to be silent for six and a half milliseconds. And I don't get why that's true. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I say as much mad as I can be from time to time, because I am a second guesser. I am an armchair quarter, or quarterback. It, it's sort of how I'm wired. It's why I started doing what I do, because I sure as hell think I know everything. No, I don't. But I, I, I do know a couple things. There were some things I didn't like about what Coach Cutter did. Uh, but I, you know, my show isn't until tomorrow, so I haven't had a chance to watch Coach's film yet. So I got to go see whether my initial reads are accurate. But in general, uh, the get off my chest is guys, calm down, right? They're still figuring out what works and what doesn't. And underneath all of that, right, underneath the whole newness of this to this staff, are injuries to key players. Mm -hmm. We we were talking coming into the season about my God, we're so deep at tight end. Holy <laughs> crap! <laughs> we got this guy cross playing who finally learned how to block. I don't know that again, he's another guy whose name is in Sharpie uh, and he's getting burned. He's getting actual playing time. Right. So 
that's all I would say. And, and I know that I get beat up on a lot because I have the audacity to tell fans that I think they're stupid from time to time. I don't mean you're really stupid when I say that. You're probably a very nice person. You pet puppies. You have kids. All that sort of stuff. And you may even be bright. But we all say stupid shit. I say it sometimes, too. So so just think about it and talk to other people and have your mind open. I was sitting next to some folks at that, at that event. They're like, well, I can't believe the Julio caught for 500 yards. We should be slinging the ball all the way down the field. Really? Because I thought the point was to get a win. Mm-hmm. That, that, uh, call me crazy, but people forget the score. They don't forget the record. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's my little get off my chest thing. I don't know if that's uh, how this segment normally works, but that, that would be my, my two cents. Yeah, no, that's that's what you're talking about is is actually right on. And I, I have something very similar to say of just saying I am sick and tired of people just complaining and crying all the time and saying, hey, it's time to change things. And in particular, for me, I'm sick and tired of hearing people talk about the Roberto Aguayo, particularly the draft pick. You know, that every time that he steps on the field, it's bad enough to me that we've got we've got these announcers that sit there every time Aguayo stepped on the field on Monday night. It was, well, there's that second round draft pick. There's the second round draft pick. That's a second round draft pick. Oh, he made the ball. That's a second round made the kick. That's a second round draft pick. Oh, he missed it. There goes a second round draft pick. And, and, And our fans turn around and get so riled up about that as well. Guys, listen, here's the thing. We can't change that now. Just on that one particular topic, the draft is over. And and to sit there and and sit back and say, well, if we would have gotten another defensive tackle, look, we had all these injuries, we'd have somebody back here at defensive tackle. Or if we would have used that on a, another running back or if we would have used it on another wide receiver or, or a safety, and God knows we need the safety help. Um, guys, it's over. It, it, it's done. But bigger than that, it's really, Derek, a lot of what you're talking about there of people that sit back and 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 bitch moan and complain, the, I, the one that I think has infuriated me the most is where people are starting to say, where I've heard people starting to say that Mike Smith doesn't know how to how to run a defense and should be fired from his job as as a defensive coordinator. That is about the dumbest ass thing that I have heard coming out of fans, actual Bucks fans, and and I will call them. You are you are, you are definitely giving too much credit if that's the dumbest thing you've heard <laughs> well i've not at, been at this for 11 years like you have derek so <laughs> keep keep listening you'll hear some really stupid shit i guarantee it, it. just i mean it, it it is i'm just getting so sick of that like guys come on first of all let's look at it these guys are now into the game into the season five games you know even roberto aguayo you look at him roberto aguayo has had five games he has not had nine you cannot count the first four preseason games because those things are still happening in camp. Like those are a part of camp. That's that's not a game. That's where you practice. That's where you go get some stuff out. He's five games in into his rookie year. And and Derek, I don't know what the difference is in the the width of the uprights in college versus the width of the uprights in the NFL. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they're that they're significantly more narrow. Um, but still, and and again, we it's so infuriating because on one level, like I know that they're right because as we even said tonight. You have one job as a kicker, kick the damn ball and put it where we need you to put it. But on the other side, I, I still have to sit back and say, we're just five games into the season. The defense is still trying to figure it out. And oh, by the way, as you just pointed out, look at all the injuries that we have. You've got to deal with that. You've got, you, you, you have to flex and move. This isn't a, this would be great if everybody came in, all of our starters were, were perfect from day one and they all went out and dominated the way that we know that they have the ability to dominate and that they were executing all of the plays, every single play perfectly, every single time and staying fresh and not getting winded by the fourth quarter. And that we had a coach who, who calls plays exactly as we think that he should call them. You know, you know what I love about Dirk Cutter and, and I, I may question some of the plays that like to sit that back and say, I might not have made that same play call there, but the man's got balls. I mean, this guy, this guy calls some, some really phenomenal, he makes some phenomenal calls. And I don't mean that by saying they're amazingly great calls. I just mean, it's phenomenal that he actually had the guts to make that call. And, and I, I love that about him, whether it's right or wrong. And I'm a person who tends to have a bias towards action. And I, if I'm going to make a mistake, I'm going to make a mistake on the side of action. And I think Dirk Cutter probably has that as well. That if he's going to make a, if he's going to make an error, he's going to make it in motion, not by, not by sitting back and him and hawing about, oh, should I do this? Should I not? He's going to make a decision. He's going to go with it. And uh, you know, really, I just stop it, guys. This is the team we got. We're not getting rid of Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter needs to write out the at minimum, in my opinion, his his five year contract. Uh, he needs the time to be able to build the team. 
in his image, so to speak, however you want to say that. We don't need to get rid of Mike Smith. And 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 I would love to see the, that Mike Smith doesn't get another head coaching job in the near future and that he just gets to stay. And, and, and you know, imagine what happens over a couple of years when we have the draft picks and, and the free agency periods to go in and for Mike Smith to help Jason Light narrow in on particular players that he's going to get to be able to really shape this defense with where he needs it to be. Uh, and, and as he learns what this defense is like, um, you know, it, it just takes time. And you know what? We've been giving them a lot of time. And I think that's where where the, the, the nerves are frayed for so many Bucks fans is they've had so much time as an organization. And I get it. But it's a new coach. It's a new coaching staff. It, it's, it's a lot of new players. We've got to just give them time, guys. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's what I want to get off my chest is I'm sick of people complaining and crying about crap like this. All yeah, the time. I, I I agree violently. Uh, the the complaints uh, I I get where they come from. Uh, that I don't think that makes them any more valid. Um, you know, it's it's very frustrating. Uh, but we've been in this reset cycle for quite some time since mm-hmm. Gruden's departure. We've been in a reset cycle, and every coach wants to build the team in their own image, and then that causes a player change, and then the draft is impactful, and mm-hmm. the hope for a franchise quarterback, and then the fall of a franchise quarterback, and then. All of this crap has has uh, had an additive effect on a fan base. It was already, to be honest, not that great a fan base, and and I know I get a lot of crap for that too, uh, because I had the audacity to say that our fan base isn't very good, and they say, oh well, we lose all the time. You know, so do a lot of other teams, and they don't cry about it all the time. Now, mm-hmm. there's a core group of thirty to forty thousand fans here that are just absolutely amazing, and I put them against the Packers fans every day of the week and twice mm-hmm. on Sundays, but. This town, just like Seattle, the only other place I've ever lived, I lived there for almost seven years, is a town for front runners. They they support winners. And to be honest, there are probably 40 other cities just like it. I don't mean to say that Seattle and Tampa are unique in that. Mm-hmm. right? But if you're a winning program, this area will support you. And all of a sudden, those folks that are wearing other team hats will find hats of the local team. Let the local team start to lose, and they take the Bucks hat off or the Lightning hat off or the Rays hat off, right? And they put the one from where they grew up if that team happens to be either a little bit better or have better lineage. And it just speaks to, a, I think, a lack of intestinal fortitude uh, in, in people nowadays. It just sucks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and Derek, I, I don't know why you started your podcast, but I can tell you this is exactly why I started this podcast, was uh, to be able to talk to the fans. You know, the podcast is directed to the fans, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I've said it real early. I said it a lot, you know, I don't report the news. We just comment on the news and, uh, you know, it's really meant to sit back to be a, a podcast by fan for the fans to help our fans know how to react and to respond. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, as we got there to be able to talk about this team that we love so much that, that I dare say there's a couple fans out there that have been like me who may have even tried to quit on the Buccaneer fan on the Buccaneers because they've been so bad so long and just found themselves not being able to, you know, like, like the Buccaneer blood is so ingrained in you. You can't, you can't quit on it. You just have to keep staying with it. And here we find ourselves as fans. And we're in a, we're in a spot where things are changing once again. And I think the drum that we need to keep beating is instead of changing things again, Let's keep them the same. Let's keep them. Let's, you know, well, that's not working. That's okay. Let's keep it the same. We'll get there. Let's ride the roller coaster. Let's ride the roller coaster because it will work out. It will get there if we just stay the course. Well, and the challenge with that, Brent, is when do you make the decision that this is the one you have to stay with, right? And that's where, you know, the crux of the problem was last year for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I started for a very similar reason as you did, right? It was by a fan, for fans. And then after a decade, there every year the first decision we have to make in the off season as an organization is do we do it again, right? right. Because we've grown into do tailgates and charitable works and all this other stuff, and it's a lot of work, right? I've got a, lot, a crew of twenty five that puts a lot of effort into this thing that we do, and that means something else has to give. Uh, and and for me, and and this isn't necessarily what you do, but you may move into that. Who knows? Part of it was I wanted to help try and educate, too. So like that's why I used to do the coaches film and why I'd have guys like Steve White on and to try and explain to people data about the game, not just the emotive side. And I think both are really important, right? The mm-hmm. passion matters, right? Fan means fanatic, and I get that. But, but become more educated so that the decisions you make and the, and the feelings you have are founded in, in some form of, of reality. And there have been three times in this 11-year run where I've been you know, one step away from going, no, I can't do it again because – 
I don't I, what I what I have found out, and maybe this is just me, Brent. Maybe you'll find something else, and maybe your fan base is a little bit different than mine is, or listener base, for lack of a better word. Um, I don't know that the average fan wants to learn, and I know that that's different than the average person. By the way, I think that there's some so, uh, some uh, sociology experiments that could be done here. <laughs> I don't think that folks really want to learn. I think they like the concept of confirmation bias. They want to gravitate towards people that say the same things that they do because then they feel that that validates their position, even if it's an invalid position, you know? So it's, it's very frustrating. And, and if, I could, if I could snap my fingers and change one thing about our fan base is I wish our fan base would take the time to become more educated. It has never been easier to become more educated in this game that we love than it is right now. For us to have access to all 22 is ridiculous. It's absolutely yeah. ridiculous, you know? Find someone, read. There's, there's countless ex-players and coaches doing uh, chalk talks. Take the time. Go to your local high school. Volunteer. Find out about this game. It is a beautiful game. It really is. I know I sound super fruity when I talk about football this way, but it is a beautiful game. The contest is so amazing. It's chess, only with violence. And if they take the time to learn, they'll have more fun at it because they'll see it. And, uh, and I have failed in that in 11 years uh, in a lot of ways. And so that's, that's depressing. But I hope that they do it, and I agree with you. I hope that this is the one they stick with, right? Whether I was bitter about them not sticking with Love You or not is really immaterial at this point. They had to stick with someone, mm-hmm. right? So might as well be Dirk. If not now, when? If not who? You know, or if not us, who? Exactly. And, you know, to close that out, uh, you know, you, you're talking about valid viewpoints, and I, I just want to make this super clear. The only valid viewpoint that we have out there is really my viewpoint. So... Uh, <laughs> No, that's not true at all. Uh, (laughs) All right, guys. Well, that is going to wrap us up here for the show. If you guys would like to chime in on the conversation Derek and I have been having, uh, you can do that in a couple ways. You can go to facebook.com forward slash the pewtercast or find us on Twitter at the pewtercast or drop us an email to the pewtercast at gmail.com. Like I said before, we do respond to all forms of communication. And if it's pretty good, we just might read it on air. Well, I'd like to thank Derek, a.k.a. Old School of the What the Buck podcast for being here. Derek, uh, why don't you take a moment, tell us where we can find you on the internet and uh, a little bit of information about your upcoming uh, tailgates and what you have going on over there. Sure, thanks, Brent. I want to thank you for having me on your podcast as well. Uh, you, you know that being around for 11 years gives me the benefit of perspective in some ways, and it's great to see all the new good content that's coming out, and there are a number of them out there on the block, yours being one of them, so I'm always excited I got excited. Actually, it started really to blow up, I think, when Buck's Brief podcast came out. I thought Chris did a great job, yeah. and I unabashedly pimped the hell out of it because I thought he did a phenomenal job. And uh, you know, he's gone on to, to greener pastures with BYOCB, but we still drag him back in uh, and not let him escape the clutches of Buccaneers podcasting. But uh, whatthebuck.net is our homepage. We're uh, sort of ubiquitous in the internet in that you can find us at whatthebuck on Twitter, facebook.com forward slash whatthebuck, Instagram, whatthebuck. We rebrand pretty consistently. Uh, our shows are typically Thursday nights. I've had to go to one show. You and I both have two children. As mine got older, I had to change my time commitment on the on the broadcast side. Mm-hmm. So we do one show Thursdays at 9 unless there's a conflict for schedule. We'll be on live tomorrow night at 9 o'clock. We broadcast on Mixler live, and then, of course, we put the podcast up in all uh, normal formats. Uh, with regards to tailgates, we are a, a charitable foundation. What the buck really matters, which is our 501c3. Our tailgates are the largest tailgate in Tampa. They're also... Uh, the only Hall of Fame tailgate in Tampa. It's at 3316 West Ohio Avenue. It's right behind One Buck Place. All of our net proceeds go to named charities. We work with local charities who we know the organizers of and either do the net proceeds or goods in kind uh, purchase from those direct proceeds if the charity has their own payroll. So when you come to our tailgate, you can expect food, drinks, fun, uh, the largest pirate ship at the Bucks game that's not in the stadium, uh, live performances by Franco, and, and a great time. We call it a family reunion with family you don't know yet. Uh, so it's great. And you can be fans of the other team. It's a family friendly event. We love having people out there. And to be honest, Brent, and you'll experience this, I think, as you continue to do the things you do. If you get a chance to travel, which I am fortunate enough to do, I usually travel to three to six games away each year. It's amazing what this ecosystem has grown into. Mm-hmm. You'll find yeah. Bucks Pod. Like I heard you talking about your supporter from, I think it was Uganda. Yeah. Right. Which is amazing. That's that's phenomenal. Like when we started doing, I think we've got, I don't know, 30 something countries, which is really cool. I don't track the stats at this point because I don't care. I don't do per click stuff or whatever. It's just nice to know when I go someplace, there's people who care enough and we can get together and have a tailgate and talk about the bucks. And it's a really great thing. So as much as I may rag on the fans for some things, there's a part of it that I truly love. And uh, and that's great. So for anyone out there who doesn't listen to us, we'd love to have you take a listen. Podcasts are funny. They're like uh, ice cream flavors. 
Sometimes it's all good ice cream, but you don't particularly care for that version of chocolate. Uh, but uh, but we'd love to have you try our chocolate out, as it were, and you can take that however you want to. It's uh, yeah, and their branded chocolate is is particularly delicious. Uh, so <laughs> I wasn't gonna say it. Uh, well, Derek, uh, once again, man, thank you, guys, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. And hey, listen, guys, as we get out of here, uh, you know, it might be easy to be like Derek and I and be sit back and be an armchair quarterback. You know, it's easy to sit back and tell others what they should do or what they should have done. And these days, it seems especially prevalent in two conversations. One, talking about what it is to be an NFL head coach and what they should or should not have done. And what it is that some politician should do. So wherever you find yourself sitting back and saying how someone else could do their job better, I want to challenge you. Instead of sitting back and criticizing others for what they're doing, get off your butt and you go get involved. Now, you and I may never be an NFL head coach or a politician of any kind. But there are plenty of things in life that we can either be critical of someone else's solution to the problem, or we can go provide our own solution to the problem. Whether that's at work, that's at home, at your church, or whatever other organizations you might be involved with, don't just sit back and complain about how people aren't doing their job. You find a way to be a part of the solution. Until next time, Bucks fans, enjoy the bye week and go Bucks. <laughs> <laughs>